Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Brian Dietrich, who runs the chief market strategist at LPL Financial. Always does a great job of putting market history and market trends into proper context. He'll talk to us about the first part of the year, what that might tell us about the remainder of 2021, where, should, where we should be focused. Overall, the market, again, chopping around distribution phase at the beginning of the day, but appreciating back to close in a position of relative strength by the end. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the message of the markets. We focus on the information the markets can provide back to us through the visualization of, uh, of stock charts, focusing on the trends, momentum, price behavior, and what that can tell us about the underlying movements of the uh, of the individual market participants. We've talked about the long-term trend in stocks, certainly some distribution signals so far in this shortened holiday week yesterday, distributing a bit again uh, today. And when I talk about distribution or accumulation days, those are general ways of summarizing price behavior on a day like today. You see a lot of red when I'm looking at the equity indexes. And while none of them are down significantly, you're certainly seeing um, some distribution. What's interesting on a day like today is it's very much led by the defensives. You had utilities up one and three quarters percent consumer staples, real estate. Those were one, two, and three at the top of the list. So in terms of overall risk on versus risk off today, very much leaning more toward the defensive side of the ledger. But overall, we're still left in this condition where the S&P continues to push onward and ever upward. We're going to dig into breadth conditions a little bit later in today's show. But I want to remind you of the upcoming schedule. We have a great guest today, Ryan Dietrich uh, from LPL Financial. Tomorrow on the 9th, we have Todd Sohn from Strategus in New York. Coming up next week on the 14th, on Tuesday, we have Louis Giannis from WealthNet Investments in Colorado. On Wednesday, the 15th, Alessio Rutugliano from uh, Wyckoff Analytics. Finally, next Thursday, we have Frank Capillary, a friend from uh, Instanet. He's the chief technical analyst there. Also, just as a reminder, coming up here very shortly, we have the TSAA. This is the uh, Technical Security Analyst Association based in San Francisco. This is an organization of uh, a number of market professionals and a lot of individual investors as well, all people passionate about technical analysis. They have their upcoming annual uh, event, which is going to be going on uh, via webcast. Uh, some fantastic speakers, uh, people like Alessio Rotigliano, which I, which I mentioned, Craig Johnson, who we've had on the show before, Ari Wald from Oppenheimer, and another, uh, another set of uh, fantastic pres uh, presenters. Go to TSAASF.org for information on that upcoming event. Also, I'll be doing the next... Uh, webcast of my own uh, from Market Misbehavior coming up next Tuesday, September 14th. The uh, event is called How to Avoid Confirmation Bias. Uh, this is one of the sneakiest behavioral biases I've seen. This is where you essentially develop your investment thesis and then you start gathering information. And if you think about that as probably the wrong way to be structuring your uh, routines, we'll talk about how it can sneak in your process, how to reverse that and focus on the evidence first. Go to marketmisbehavior.com slash confirmation bias if you're interested in that free event next Tuesday. Continuing on, I am super excited to bring a segment back that we have not done in a long time, the mystery chart. Uh, we did this back when we used to be in the studio, sort of pre-COVID days. We're now uh, able to bring these sorts of, uh, of live features back to you. And so I present to you today's mystery chart. I'm showing it on the screen right now. I have covered up all identifying markets besides the value of the, uh, of the instrument or of the uh, item that we're looking at. This is a uh, data series. If there's any hint I can give you, it would be look at the price value, look at the value on the Y axis, look at the trend in this thing. And uh, the fact that it's only showing closing prices means it's most likely not a stock or an ETF because we usually can get open, high, low, close pricing on something like that. So my question is, what is this mystery chart? A little later in today's show, we're going to reveal what the mystery chart is and talk about why it may be an important, an important piece of information to uh, pay attention to. So what is this mystery chart? Let's continue on with today's market recap. So let's talk about the uh, the overall environment, the S and P. You know, again, sort of a choppy uh, day today with uh, with plenty of fluctuations. I've you know talked about weeks like this 
being digestion weeks. You feel like the trend leading up to this week, going into last Friday before the long holiday weekend, uh, is a uh, sort of the big meal. And now we are digesting that meal. And, and you see the choppiness. You see movement of offense versus defense. You see a lot of fluctuations. And uh, overall today, you know, if there's a data point to pay attention to, besides the fact that the indexes are lower, besides the fact that mid caps and small caps continue to underperform uh, the uh, large and mega caps, it's that today was led by the defensive utilities who are actually up almost 2% today, while something like energy and materials, some of the cyclical sectors down uh, a little more significantly. At the Looking at the major averages, the uh, S&P down 0.1%, so really just a, a, a rounding error below zero, to be totally honest with you at the end of the day. Mid caps and small caps down a little more. The NASDAQ 100 down about a third of a percent, so a little bit underperforming stocks today. Interest rates actually coming off a bit. Now, we talked about the 10-year yield and the movement uh, uh, there. And overall, it's been sort of in a choppy phase as well. The TLT, which we usually use as a proxy for bond prices, up two-thirds of a percent today. But uh, but overall, this has been sort of a choppy period. Yeah, yields coming down pretty significantly with the 10-year yield hitting sort of 1.1, popping back up to 133 or so. Um, that's one of the important uh, you know items to certainly pay attention to is see where uh, those yields go because stronger or, or higher or lower yields certainly have a lot of ripple effects for different parts of the economy or indications of economic strength, uh, suggestions or headwinds and tailwinds for particular sectors are worth uh, paying attention to. The dollar index essentially flat using the UUP. Commodities overall a little bit stronger, although gold and silver precious metals uh, weaker. We looked at the chart of gold a little bit yesterday and uh, you know, sort of a real uh, downside reversal in the charts of gold and silver continuing to push down uh, a little bit lower today with silver really leading the way down out of all the group of commodities that we pay, atten pay attention to. Overall, the commodity complex, not too bad though, and up a little bit, even though the energy sector is actually the worst performer today. Cryptocurrency is actually mixed. So we saw Bitcoin down about one and a half percent from yesterday, big distribution yesterday, really leading into the uh, equity trading session coming out of the uh, the Labor Day weekend holiday, settling in around 47,000, but that was down from above 52,000 less than 24 hours earlier. Since then, it's been sort of choppy, and Bitcoin certainly are uh, currently just above 46,000. Ethereum actually rotating higher today and getting back to the positive here around 3,500. The chart of the S&P 500 is where we're going to go uh, next. And, and again, I, I feel like a bit of a broken record with this. But to be honest with you, investing, I would argue, a lot of times should feel a lot more like a broken record and not like trying to reinvent yourself every day. I've argued, you know, I think for a lot of investors, specifically investors that are not focused on, uh, you know, on actively investing, aren't self-directed investors, the best thing you can do is invest early and often and let time be your best uh, best friend to generate long-term returns. And as you know, my guest, Ryan Dietrich, would probably tell you the long-term trend in stocks overall has been fairly positive. And that's been the long-term trend that's uh, that's been very constructive for a lot of investors for many, many decades, if not centuries. Um, having said that, a day like today, a bit of a bit of a down day yesterday as well, coming off of all-time highs last week as the S&P tees the 4550 level. So We've talked about some of the key things to pay attention to. I would argue that this trend in the S&P 500 remains constructive. It remains positive until you see three things occur. And once those three things occur, you will hear me very uh, openly and broadly and, and, uh, and vocally suggest that we need to think a lot more defensively. Step one is we need to stop making new all-time highs, which we did last week. Number two, we need to start making new swing lows, right? We're in this pattern of continued higher highs and higher lows. We've had pullbacks but they keep uh, you know, uh, stopping the pullback higher than the previous pullback. And that's the sign of a strong, healthy uptrend. So right now that line in the sand, this first red horizontal line is around 4360 or so. That's the swing low from mid-August. We remain above there. And I would argue overall, the trend is still very, very positive. The third item I would look for is finally uh, you know, giving or, or registering a, a valid signal or a, a follow through below the 50 day moving average. We've closed below the 50 day moving average less than five times. And it, on one hand, you can count the number of closes below the 50 day moving average. And every single one of those times we've closed back above it the next day. It happened back here in January, here in March. Uh, uh, here again in June, and from there, we've remained above there. So once those three things happen, a lower high, a lower low, we get through the 50-day moving average and follow through, meaning some sort of confirmed breakdown. Once those three things happened, uh, you, it's hard to be thinking that the market is in an uptrend anymore. Then you have to start thinking, I would argue, a lot more defensively. And also tells you until those three things happen, 
overall, the trend is uh, is very constructive. In some ways, it's very easy to be a trend follower because you just follow these trends as they continue. It can be very, very difficult as you start to feel short-term weakness and get concerned about how that might impact the long-term trend. But focus on the charts, as always, would be my main suggestion for you. We're going to talk a little bit more about breadth. We have a whole segment called Banking on Breadth where we're focused on some of the breadth characteristics. So I don't want to get too deep into that yet, but we will talk very quickly about some of these sector and, uh, and group themes here very quickly. So utilities, as I mentioned, uh, number one, we talked about the utilities sector uh, before. Uh, you know, The challenge for the XLU is the fact that the relative strength overall over the last couple of years has not been particularly positive. The challenge I have with charts like the XLU, charts like the XLP, consumer staples, is while they seem okay on an absolute basis, this is why looking at the relative strength is so vital because it keeps you into things that are outperformed, they're performing better than a passive product, keep you away from things that are underperforming. The challenge for the XOU is a long-term stretch, long-term trend of underperformance. That may be beginning to change though. It's made a relative low in July and for the rest of July and now August, it's actually been outperforming the S&P for the last two months or so. The question on days like today, can that be a longer term trend that continues? This would be the chart that I would be watching to make that call. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Ryan Dietrich. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the power of stock charts, using technical analysis, data visualization techniques to make sense of these markets in uncertain times. A couple quick announcements before we get to my guest today, Ryan Dietrich. First off, we would love to hear from you. We are here to point you in the right direction as you are analyzing your own charts, as you are trading your portfolio, as you're managing risk, as you're making all those decisions. We are here to help nudge you in the right direction, particularly in areas of technical analysis, behavior of finance, investor psychology, routines, and so forth. You can get your questions to us a couple different ways via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com, via Twitter at final bar SCTV. On our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to get your questions. We'll answer them hopefully in our next mailbag segment on Friday show. Also, do me a favor, go to stockchartstv.com. Use your email address, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our fantastic content from our website, also your mobile devices. Great guests like Ryan Dietrich and many others. Great special events like The Pitch, Charting the Second Half, our Mid-Year Market Outlook, and also great uh, shows that we have running 24 hours a day on Stock Charts TV. Go to stockchartstv.com or search on any of the app stores from your mobile device for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Ryan Dietrich. Ryan's the chief market strategist at LPL Financial. He's been on the show before, always does such a great job here on social media and elsewhere to make sense, help us understand the trends that are in play in the markets. Ryan, welcome back today. Dave, thank you for having me. I think last time I was on was like five or six months ago. So all we've done is go straight up since then. So yeah. I was, was going to say, it's been a nice, <laughs> consistent uptrend, sort of slow and steady grind pushing yeah. higher since you were here last. Now you're starting us talking a little bit about, you know, thinking, uh, I, I know a lot of investors thinking sort of risk on versus risk off, looking at the, uh, the, the investability of stocks versus bonds. Start us here. What are you seeing? Yeah, I mean... It, the good news, we still think stocks are going to outperform bonds right here at LPL Research. I'm part of a 30-person research team, and we help more than 19,000 advisors. And kind of the big thing we want to get right is our stocks going to do better than bonds, right? When we construct portfolios for our advisors and their clients. And, you know, we came into this year expecting this bull market to keep going. We thought stocks would significantly outperform bonds. And that's obviously happened with the S&P up almost 20% for the year and bonds virtually flat. But you see on the chart here, you know, we've had this consolidation for the last couple of months when you look at just simply stocks versus bonds, right? But all of a sudden, Dave, we're seeing that breakout. And we'll see if the breakout holds. Um, but, you know, to us, it looks like a consolidation period and we fall fully expect the rest of this year for this upward bias in equities to still remain in play. And again, for stocks to continue to probably outperform bonds here. And that's a perfect chart. We think that sums it all up. It's such a great chart. And I, and I love talking with you and getting these simple messages, uh, Ryan, because I know a lot of advisors sort of still rely on a what, what could be described as a fairly antiquated model, just thinking like a 60-40 model, stocks versus bonds. Mm -hmm. And 
the end of the day, the trends can tell you a lot about where the opportunities may lie. Now, your second chart is actually or a table focusing on what we've seen year to date and what that might tell us about the rest of the year. What is this saying? Yeah, like you said, I kind of love making tables, and here's a good one, I think. Um, so again, we're up 20% for the year, on the S&P at least, as of the end of, of, of August. That's like the best start to a year since 1997, and you can see here it's the sixth best start ever. Now, what we're sharing are the 10 best starts to a year ever, again, as of the end of August. And you can see September, I see some red on there. Hey, when you're up a lot, maybe you finally have the seasonal weakness, as we all know, the last 10 years, last 20 years, since 1950. September is the worst month of the year. Um, but check out on the right, rest of the year. I know scary 1987 is in there, down 25% the rest of the year. But you're up eight out of nine times the other nine. And, uh, you know, we just there's other things we can talk about. But I'll tell you, Dave, you know, we look at things like this and a lot of other statistics. I mean, hey, S&P is up seven months in a row, all right? Six months later, the S&P has been higher 13 out of 14 times after a seven-month win streak. So that's another example. But just all these things I'm seeing and we've been sharing continue to suggest you want to be overweight stocks relative to bonds. And this bull market, he's still got some time left in our view. Now, when you think, Ryan, between here and year end, given the potential here for further strength, right? Mm -hmm. Where would you be looking opportunistically if you had new money to work? Is it more, you know, things like technology, communication services, see the NASDAQ 100 continuing to lead overall? Is that where you'd be leaning? Or is it more some of the cyclicals, things like mm -hmm. financials, energy, uh, you know, things that have been a little more beaten down and could be a part of a recovery if things are strong? Where are you looking opportunistically now? Yeah, we're, we're tilting a little bit toward those cyclical value. Like you said, it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, my goodness, financials have been strong. Look at the flows if you look at XLF. I mean, nobody really believes financial, the financial rally. You talk about market sentiment. I like being the contrarian there. You know, QQQ, I mean, my goodness gracious, tech has been great. Big cap tech has been great. But that's where all the flows are going. So it's like when everyone's on one side of the boat, I kind of tend to go the other side. So cyclical value, your financials, industrials, we like. We're neutral on tech, don't have a problem with it. But you mentioned small caps earlier. We still think small caps could have a pretty good into your rally. Do not forget, last year, the Russell 2 gained 25% in the fourth quarter. My opinion, the Russell 2 has simply been consolidating after that historic gain in the fourth quarter. And we wouldn't be surprised at all if, if small caps had another really strong fourth quarter to end out this year. That would certainly be a change if we saw small caps really mm -hmm. start to participate and outperform. Ryan, yep. listen, it is always so fun to have you on. I wish we could spend more time chatting because you're a wealth of information. But listen, thanks for giving me a little piece of it uh, today. Be well, stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon. Go Buckeyes, Dave. Thank you, sir. We'll see you. <laughs> go Bucks, Ryan. Thanks again. Um, I am super happy to bring on guests that will uh, give me a Go Bucks or OH at the end. Appreciate Ryan. And listen, Ryan, uh, if you've not followed his work, I encourage you to follow him on social media if you can. He does a really good job of illuminating market history. And, and again, it's it's kind of counterintuitive, I think, for some people. After the markets have had a big run, you have a lot of people talking about potential downside, about how we're overvalued, about how much higher the market can go and what I think Ryan's work is, uh, is showing you is that, uh, you know, when the market has been strong, a lot of times the tendency is the market to continue to show strength. And, and again, I think it's a really good time, as always, to be a trend follower and focus on the message that the markets themselves are providing for us. Let's continue on with our next segment, Banking on Breadth. So we love to do, uh, you know, thinking about the big picture environment for uh, equities is to think of it as a, as a three-part approach, right? Price, breadth, and sentiment. And we, at, you know, spent a lot of time focused on price, I think, for very good reason. Uh, you know, I was all told by my mentors, Ralph Akampora, um, guys like Jeff Weiss at Clearview Trading Advisors, who uh, did such a great job early in my career, helping me think about the markets very simplistically, just looking at long-term trend lines and keeping it very straightforward. But they, what they reminded me is that the long-term trend is most important and focusing on price. If you know nothing else, look at the value of the S&P. That's going to tell you most of what you need to know about conditions for stocks, right? All the other stuff is just uh, confirming evidence. Is are, there, are there things to confirm or deny what you're seeing with price? But price is where it has to start. I have learned that there are two other pieces to that puzzle, which I've tried to refine over my career. The second is breadth, which are looking at the conditions that are creating that price movement. The index, the market is doing A, what are the uh, you know uh, stocks that make up that index? What are they actually doing? And that's the breadth component. Sentiment, we talk about often on Thursdays on the show, and that's where we focus on um, the uh, you know what investors are saying, what they're voting with their capital, but also voting with their uh, words, how they're responding to, uh, you know, are you bullish bears, things like that. Thinking about breadth, we're going to continue uh, on looking at the uh, cumulative advanced decline lines. And we're looking at this chart. Um, this is a chart we usually refer to on Friday. This is part of our uh, Mindful Investor Live chart list. 
and it has four different cumulative advanced decline lines. So again, this is looking every day at how many stocks are closing higher or lower. You take that total net amount and you string them together by uh, adding those every day or subtracting them every day. At the end of a long period of time, you have a cumulative advanced decline line. You have a long-term trend of daily advancers and decliners. At the top, we have the New York Stock Exchange, then we have the S&P 500, then S&P mid cap, S&P small cap. And looking at each of these four particular buckets, the NYSE, as you can see, I've color coded this green along with the S&P, the large caps, and as, long as, and as well as mid caps. I've done that because all four of them have now, or excuse me, all three of them have broken above their most recent swing highs. The large cap breadth, by the way, has remained very, very positive this entire time. There's really no change in that positive trend. The NYSE common stock only AD line and the mid cap line at times stopped going higher, actually made a lower high there July into August. I think that's changed now. And you've seen in the last week, these uh, these breadth lines making new swing highs. That's a sign of a, of a healthy market environment. The only one that is not made a new high is the small cap AD line, which is at the bottom, still colored a neutral orange color, in my opinion, because it's still sort of uh, sideways. It's interesting. Um, I guess Ryan Dietrich today talked about the return of small caps. It'd be interesting. And I think this breadth line turning positive could be one of the confirmations that that's actually starting to manifest itself uh, in, uh, in reality. The next one I want to look at is jumping down a couple here. Uh, let's see. This is the uh, chart looking at the percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average, the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. We currently have, as of yesterday's close, about 79% of S&P 500 members uh, closing above or, or trading above their 200 day moving average. We have 59, 60%, we'll call it, uh, above their uh, above their 50 day moving average. What's interesting is that's just starting to turn lower a little bit. And, and uh, the reason why I think this could be an interesting chart to watch is when you've seen this trend where it reverses lower, it tells you that conditions could be starting to, starting to form where the market uh, has some downside potential because a lot of times this will reflect internal weakness before it's reflected on uh, the chart of the market itself. You saw that in January to February of 2020, where the market went higher, but you can see these uh, these uh, breadth indicators are actually sloping downwards because on that last push higher into the February 2020 high, less stocks were actually regaining their 50-day, less stocks were regaining their 200-day. And that told you that a lot of individual names had were already in the breakdown phase. So that might be something to watch here. We've sort of topped out in the 70% range for stocks above their 50-day, we've lost about 10% of stocks here in the last week or so that have gone back to below their 50-day. This line going down tells you that more and more stocks are not holding that key level of support. They're actually breaking down. So that would be an interesting indicator to watch uh, going forward for sure. Um, last chart or two I want to show you is just thinking of new highs or new lows. I think strong bull market phases are marked by a consistent pattern of new 52-week uh, highs. You want a healthy number of stocks that are continuing to push to, uh, to new 52-week highs, showing you overall the trend is positive, right? As the S&P is making new all-time highs, you don't want it to be a small number of stocks also making new highs. You want it to be more and more because that tells you that it is a broader advance with a lot of names able to eclipse their previous extremes. You also want to keep your eye on the new lows list to see if that starts to expand a little bit. Here we're blowing up the uh, the NYSC new lows list. It's not many. I mean, it's still only 15 stocks out of hundreds and hundreds that we're tracking in the, uh, in the uh, New York Stock Exchange, if not thousands. Uh, but you can see that if you would have an increase in new lows, if that new lows list would start to go down a little bit, we saw that in August, actually, um, that can tell you that a lot of individual names are really starting to come down a little bit. That's when things like energy and others start to rotate lower staples and others that were really at 52-week lows that have remained uh, fairly depressed. So another set of uh, breadth indicators to watch. So overall, are the conditions uh, okay? Absolutely. I think the conditions breadth-wise are actually improving. And I think this is the most important breadth chart to, uh, to pay attention to the cumulative advanced decline lines. When those don't confirm new highs in stocks, I think you have to be wary. What's happened in the last month, these indexes have gone from not confirming to starting to confirm once again, uh, the strength in stocks. So when I hear about the potential of stocks to go higher through now and the year end, this is one of the charts that tells me that uh, that, that is certainly a possible, if not likely outcome for the S&P. That is our segment, Banking on Breath, touching on some of the key breadth indicators. Let us get back to the mystery chart. Did you guess what this was? I will give you a couple further hints if you did not. This is not one particular asset. This is actually a ratio of two different things, of one versus the other. It's actually not a ratio. That's not true. As I'm saying that, it's actually the difference between two interest rates. This is the difference between the 10-year yield and the two-year yield, which is a simpler, I call it a yield spread. So basically, you look at two different uh, interest rates and you take the one minus the other. And it's done often to think about 
you know, credit spreads, looking at the, uh, you know, uh, corporate bonds versus government bonds. Here, we're actually doing a treasury spread where we're looking at the 10-year versus the two-year. This is a simple way of looking at the shape of the yield curve and just thinking, are, is the yield curve steepening or flattening? And the shape of the yield curve has broad implications. And that's the reason why we're, uh, we, we have this as today's mystery chart. When the yield curve is steepening, that tends to be a really good thing for financials, particularly banks, because they make money on the shape of the yield curve, generally speaking. It's certainly one of the main ways they can make money by uh, borrowing money at the short end of the curve and lending it out to you to buy a car or a house or something at the long end of the curve. And by looking at this Spread of twos versus tens, you can see overall are the conditions better or worse? Are there headwinds and tailwinds for financial firms? Financial stocks have uh, struggled at times here year to date, but there have been times they've certainly been in a leadership role. As yield curves, uh, the yield curve is steepening, as you're seeing this uh, spread actually break out a little bit to the upside. It's certainly something to watch, the same as you'd watch the uh, 10 year interest rate, uh, just to see if the conditions continue to be uh, more, uh, more positive for. Uh, financial stocks and 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 in general to, can be an indicator of the strength of the economy as well. By the way, if you've not looked at that before, if you go to charts and tools in the upper left corner and go down to the dynamic yield curve, it is a really cool visualization that shows you uh, the um, uh, sorry, it's right here on the uh, on the right side. Shows you the S and P five hundred and the shape of the yield curve. So we're looking at twos versus tens. You can actually push play and watch the markets evolve over time and look at the shape of the yield curve and understand a little better that important relationship. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the spread of the twos and the tens. We finished our mystery chart segment, unveiling that yield spread as our mystery chart of the day. I'm showing it here with the relative performance of the financial sector. What's interesting in uh, in the last couple of weeks is you've actually seen the uh, yield spread increase, actually go higher, talking about a steepening yield curve, but you actually see the financial sector underperforming. If you look over time, it tends to be a pretty consistent relationship, right? The better that, or the higher that this ratio goes or the spread goes, the better that financials uh, as a sector tend to uh, tend to do. It's a bit of a dislocation right now with uh, with spread steepening or the yield curve steepening and with uh, with relative performance going down. What I've learned over my career is to follow the spread and that the performance of financials will most likely follow. So that's certainly a chart to pay attention to here going forward. Chart number two, we had a segment banking on breadth. We talked about breadth conditions. And again, overall, I've seen breadth from very deteriorating conditions to more neutral conditions. And now in some ways, more bullish, although I would say it's still mixed, right? You still have only, you know, four out of five S&P members above their 200 day, but that's still 80% of the, of the index. That's still not too bad. You have the percent of stocks above their 50 day actually coming off here in the last couple of days. And I think this is a really important to watch to see if you see further deterioration in stocks above their moving averages. This can be a great way as we talk about the importance of the S&P remaining above its 50 day moving average as a sign of overall strength and trend consistency um, individual names, it's the same idea. A lot of institutional investors will use that 50-day or that 10-week moving average as sort of a line in the sand to make sure that they're invested in the securities that are holding up well on a trend basis. Uh, you know, the stocks breaking below the 50-day has uh, challenges for those individual charts, but also rolled up as a breadth indicator has some implications as well. Finally, just to remind you, it is not a homogenous market. When I talk about the fan mag trade or the fang trade, a lot of these big consumer uh, technology communications names, uh, Twitter is a bit of an outlier. If you look, a lot of these stocks making new all-time highs, particularly the fang stocks, those six names, the fan mag names that we've talked about, almost all of them uh, making new highs here recently and in long, consistent uptrends. But as you can see from Twitter, it's not everything, right? Twitter actually made a lower high in April, made a little bit of a lower high there in July, although I think you could consider that testing the previous resistance levels. So you have a really clear ceiling uh, for the chart of Twitter. Now it's breaking down once again, back below the 50-day moving average, testing it from below and now rotating back lower, down 4% today. It's nearing that 200-day moving average. The last time it tested there in May, Spent about a week before, before rotating higher. I'd be very keen to watch this chart to see if it remains in a downtrend and is able to follow through below the 200-day moving average. Also, that first Fibonacci level as well. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Ryan Dietrich from LPL Financial joining us from Charlotte and uh, giving us his thoughts on the overall market and potential for the rest of this year. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, be well. Have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.